We are live. Welcome, folks. Thank you for joining me for the latest edition of the Coaches Connect call. I am Coach Jeremy, and I am joined by so many lovely coaches today. It's fantastic. We have a good group out here. Uh, we'll see what kind of discussions that we can get up to today. But before we solicit more conversation from the coaches here, uh, Coach Tony, you had a discussion that you wanted to start, and I believe kind of it's, would be housed under the idea of uh, having complimentary businesses, reaching out to fellow professionals, uh, and you were looking for some feedback from our community. Yeah, my my question is to everybody is basically as we're looking to, you know, essentially what we're talking about marketing and getting our business to more channels. I've always been more of like I do my own thing and not really venturing out to partner out with other people. But as I work with other marketing people, they I can see how important working partnerships is. And so what I wanted to find out, especially specifically from this community, because I mean, I don't know about you guys, PN, like I have a lot of respect for PN. So when I, but I, when I go out into like the marketing world, there's like a lot of like people selling like snake oil. So it's like hard for me to trust anybody else. So I want to know what like legit coaches are doing in order to partner up, you know, what people are like, you know, are they selling supplements? Are they doing like partnering up with like a med, like a meditation or like yoga, for instance, are they doing like cross discipline stuff with somebody who might be more in the mental wellness space? And who's doing that successfully? And if they can share any best practices, that would be that would be great. Uh, fair enough. And I'll open that up with the community. But on behalf of PN, uh, thanks for the shout out. And yeah, <laughs> it's perfectly OK if you want to work with some other folks every now and then. Uh, we will not hold it against you. Yeah, so does anyone have any unique partnerships that they have? Uh, that they've personally cultivated that either maybe if you work for a larger entity as well or if you are part of a business any specific partnerships or advice on crafting those partnerships that you can share with tony i don't know if this is valuable but i do work for a supplement company and that's why one of the reasons I'm here. So they want some they want somebody that is more or has an authority in the nutrition space within the social media um team. So that's me. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. Uh how did they approach you or how did you approach them? Mm, I think it was the CEO that was um, I don't know. He was really interested in PN, and he wanted to have somebody, you know, certified the, the with this uh, course. So that was pretty much it. Fair. Uh, yeah. This is, I think, probably in terms of collaboration for nutrition coaches this is probably one of the more obvious routes where it's like there's clear synergy between what a nutrition company offers and your ability to connect with your clients as a coach and potentially recommend those products to them. So uh, I know PN for a long time had a, a rec or a relationship with a company called Thorn Nutraceuticals. So they were a, a supplement company that we would often recommend uh, and PN coaches could create kind of a an account and you can share information with clients and get them to sign up for stuff uh, i don't know if that's something that we're currently doing and i don't i remember getting like one check randomly for like 50 bucks one day and i was like i have no idea why i got this check uh but i'm gonna cash it and i'll wait for you guys to come for it so it's still the 50 dollars is still there if you're listening to thorn nutraceuticals uh but yeah that one makes a lot of sense uh, is there any interest on your end in reaching out or being a brand ambassador for a nutri uh, for a nutrition company, Tony? Uh, I, I mean, I've been hit up my my Instagram. You know, my my posts get like I have like decent exposures. So I get hit up with companies all the time with you know promote either my brand, my clothing, or whatever whatever the case may be. But I've, I'm like those always look to me like it's something where I'm just like promoting their stuff. And so mm -hmm. I wanted more of an actual partnership. 
of like, hey, I'm going to get in front of your audience, you get in front of my audience, and how do we gotcha. help the business grow? As opposed to me just repping your stuff and I send you a discount code, 10% off my whatever. But that 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 doesn't fly for me and I, it just leaves a bad taste in my mouth. So yeah. I'm looking for like, hey, this is a company that's reputable. This is what we're doing. I get in front of your audience and I want to know if like there's people doing that now and if they are, are like what, mm-hmm. what, what's successful because that what what i've doing so far and like this is, and i've been doing this for a long time this is like the first step i'm doing of actually reaching out to other professionals and mm-hmm. other peers and being like okay you specialize in meditation and yoga which i think is pretty awesome i can offer that to my client base and start working that kind of like that symbiotic partnership of you, you specialize in this and there's somebody else that specializes in sleep for instance mm-hmm. that i think would be like an, another awesome where we can swap lead magnets, swap audiences, and help each other grow. Fair enough, yeah. And I mean, uh, Tobias mentions in the in the chat box that it's really important that you have to share similar philosophies and you have to both vibe on the same message that you're sharing overall. I also think there's, like, there's an ethical consideration for it as well. Uh, and I, this was specifically, or more specifically, maybe speaks to the conversation regarding uh, as you're sharing like supplement company, sharing a, like a discount code, that kind of stuff, being a brand rep, which is typically, again, lower hanging fruit. I know a lot of companies where it's like, you can just sign up and be a rep. There's no real vetting process for anything. Uh, I think the larger conversation there is that anything that you put your name to, you should be willing to stand behind that product just from like an ethical standpoint. Right. Uh, and then also, is this kind of like a quick buck kind of like pass? quote unquote passive income or is this something where it's like I actually have a vested interest in the company. I believe in its growth. I I've directed it in some form or fashion. Uh for what you're saying, the the idea of kind of collaborating with the company, I think that's requires a little bit more thought and time investiture. Uh and actually the way that I would approach this if I were you is how can I make this a clear win-win for both myself and for the company that I'm working with? So how can I provide value and how can I clearly define my value to your community? So not only am I getting in front of your clients, you're getting in front of mine. It's like, here is something that I can provide that is tangible to your people and I can prove that. Because at the end of the day, if you're looking to ally with another business, uh, especially a larger, more established business, They're going to want to be able to see, like, how does this impact the bottom line? How does this add value to my community, but also help drive sales, things of that nature? Yeah, thanks, Jeremy. That's a really good point. Yeah, so if you can clearly, like, share how that would work, it makes those conversations a lot easier. And people will sit up a little bit more and take you straight as opposed to just reaching out and saying, hey, I'm a fan of your work. Uh, I would love to collaborate sometime. That's a great first step, and some people might take you up on it, but doing some of the back-end work first and showing this is a clear win-win for both of us. Here's how I can impact your bottom line. Here is how I can share value with your community. That is uh, a lot. It's going to take you a lot further. Sweet. Thanks. Yeah, no worries. Thank you for getting us kicked off. Uh, Before we move on, any coaches have any experience or anything that they'd want to share with Tony? I in terms of building brand relationships or collaborative relationships with other businesses and entities? Um, I used to trade with my physical therapist. And so I would train her and she would treat me. And then oftentimes she would send me her, her patients and from time to time, I'd be able to send her clients as well. So, and we also had a a coaching with Lucas Rockwood of Yoga Body, and he suggested that we have um, in person coach parties to have these kind of discussions. And I think the same thing would work on Zoom. What would entail an in person coaching party or a Zoom based coaching party? Because well, in my mind, it yeah. kind of just is this, but I am curious if there's other details. <laughs> yeah. So in person, um, it was, you know, one of the coaches would host it. It would be a regular thing and they would provide some snacks and then everybody would come over and just say, hey, these are my clients or 
I have a client who I'm not sure how to solve this problem. Maybe you could help or do you have any suggestions? Just kind of open discussion about how to best be of service. And then if natural partners, partnerships develop, great. And if they don't, you know, try again next week or or just, you know, it's it's still a win-win. You've got like-minded people talking about how to serve well. And then uh, on I see you'd Coach have Kate is here and I hope she's taking notes here. One, we need to have rebrand to coaching parties and two, we need more snacks and a higher snack budget. I'm gonna <laughs> argue for that in my next uh, contract renewal. Cool. Yeah, but I do agree. And like we've, uh, both Kate and myself have hosted what we just refer to as like PN meetups whenever we travel around uh, to see kind of like, hey, what is the, what is the local coaching culture like here? What can we share with each other? And then ideally, I mean, the thing that we want the most is after we leave, relationships are formed here and people keep meeting up and keep collaborating. So we, I strongly agree with you, Anna. Uh, yeah, being able to sit down with, with your peers in a virtual space or an in-person space is fantastic. And case in point, the last Toronto-based meetup we had, uh, I met up with a coach and he introduced me to someone who is helping me to launch another allied business. Uh, and it was just because they, we ran into each other. We had a conversation, we were catching up and he said, oh yeah, you know, I think you should connect with this person. I'm going to give them your number. They'll give you a call later. And yeah, several months later, it's been a very fruitful relationship. Cool. I just also wanted to point out that yesterday I went to a marketing luncheon and there were people, there were more life coaches than there were real estate agents. <laughs> there were 120 people. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I thought that was a really interesting way. I did not expect to meet wellness coaches or life coaches and um, a lot of different expertises. I learned so much and it was a huge thing. So it's also a model that you could develop in your own community. It's called Desert United and he's helping other communities model their own monthly luncheons. You go to one restaurant and there's a presenter, maybe it's a nonprofit or maybe it's one of the coaches and everybody has 20 seconds to introduce themselves and then three minutes with a timed sand timer at the table each. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, if anyone here on the call is listening and you want to uh, meet other coaches in your neighborhood, feel free to use the PN community as a springboard for that very feature. Put out a conversation, say, hey, I'm in your area. If you ever want to meet up, let's plan something together. You can also use the PN coaching directory. If people have put their coaching information there or their contact information there, feel free to reach out to those professionals who are either around you or share a similar skill set as you uh, and see if there's an uh, opportunity to collaborate. And if nothing else, you can just form those relationships and talk and you never know what's going to come from them. Uh, coaching tends to be a quite lonely endeavor, especially as most of us are uh, solo entrepreneurs. So yeah, finding spaces where you can collaborate with others, ask questions, uh, share ideas is incredibly valuable. Kind of like what's happening here. Cool. Uh, Tony, thank you for getting us kickstarted there. Uh, and Anna, thank you for sharing your feedback as well. Uh, Sarah, are you still around here? I see that you had a question in the chat box as well. Do you uh, want to unmute and give us a little bit more background information on uh, what it is that you're seeking? Hi. Um, I'm... I, I wrote in the chat box that I like to use the PN Penguin calculator because it, you know, it's a very nice printout at the end. But it doesn't, it's not working for me that most of my clients are either lactating women, they're in their childbearing years or pregnant, many of them. I, I, that's the community, that's the age group that I, and I don't know how to adjust that. It doesn't give me the option on the settings to figure that out. And I did try like making them more active, but then they get the wrong representation. Then when they get when they get the info, they're made out to be more active than they are. Uh, so pregnancy falls under. I assume that you've completed your level one certification so far for nutrition. I've done level two. Okay, cool. So then, if you go back to your level one uh, information, chapter mm -hmm. nineteen. 
uh, under the special circumstances, I believe it's called, or special, what is the title here? Special scenarios. Uh, page 208 has our information on pregnancy. It's obviously quite concise. It's not a full like manual on working with pregnant clients, but it does give you some considerations there and some ideas that you can work in to your coaching practice. Uh, and if all of your clients are pregnant or breastfeeding or are around that kind of pre and postpartum like age bracket uh, or the typical age bracket, you may want to consider looking into the Girls Gone Strong uh, courses for uh, pregnancy and pre and postpartum. That wasn't, thank you, but it wasn't really my question. My question is I know how to adjust the calories, but mm -hmm. I, I wanted to use the PN calorie calculator tool which I then give out, to, which I could then print out for the client. And it, you know, it's got all those nice infographics and it's just very pretty, mm -hmm. but it doesn't include on there the option of, I, I haven't found an option of choosing if they're, if they're in, if I can add that to the calculator. I wanted to hear if anybody else has come across this issue. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's unlikely that there is a specific tool meant for that population but you can use the information in level one to take the recommendation and modify it for your needs. I just don't know how I would practically do that on the calculator. You understand, I'm, I'm, I'm doing, you know, it asks you how active your client is and it asks you <clears throat> what type of menu and how many meals they want a day and all of that. And then it gives you, let's say, um, it tells you they need a certain amount of calories and it's got the client's name and you want to send it to the client. If I have to make modifications, I can't use that document specifically that PN has made for me. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the recommendation that I would be giving you would be use the tool and then add an addendum to it. Say, hey, client, here's what it's currently recommending. I would add these recommendations in addition, either changing to a higher calorie uh, recommendation based on your current energy needs or your breastfeeding needs. And if that doesn't work, then you'll need to find a new tool for it. Okay, so you're saying it does, it's not unprofessional to add a line at the end and... Um, no, it's more professional. It's saying that I understand the, the limitations of this tool and I understand your needs better than a tool on the internet can. Okay, thank you very much. Yep. So, I mean, uh, if you do find a tool that calculates and takes into your requirements for pregnancy, which is typically going to be just a generic range that they're going to give you for like plus 250 to plus 500 calories exactly. based on the needs. Yeah. Exactly. So, but what's, you know, what's not the PN has just such a nice printout. All the other ones don't make it as mm -hmm. nice. I will say for any document that I've ever received from a physiotherapist or any other medical professional, the more scratched up and additional things or things that were blotted out, I can tell that this person actually took the time to read it and make those changes for me. That says like, oh, here's the level of personalization that I'm giving you on top of this. It's not just a fancy printout that could look quite generic. It is something that I have put time and effort into and made sure that it is relevant specifically to you. Okay, that's nice. Okay, great. Thank you very much for that one. Mm -hmm. No worries. Okay, Any additional feedback or, or uh, insight to share with Sarah? Hey, I, I have been using this uh, calculator as well. Mm -hmm. And what I have been doing is like uh, just removing some of the information of the report because I feel it's like too general. Like if my client is specifically trying to lose weight, I just would remove the information for a weight gain or anything else. And mm -hmm. additionally, and additionally, I think there are some other links in the in the report to other resources. But the thing is that I want this to be like, this is coming from me, not from PN, you know, because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm the coach. And other times uh, I know, uh, so Precision Nutrition offers coaching. So <laughs> I feel like mm -hmm. um, 
giving them those links to my clients might be like just promoting another business instead of mine. <laughs> so <laughs> I just wanted to say that. Yeah, and I mean, that is fair. And that is feedback that we've gotten before. So a couple of things to address that. One, you can add your own, if you have access to the PN professional calculator, which you should have if you're level one or uh, level one nutrition, I believe, potentially SSR and potentially also the macro specific course that we have should all give you access to the level one calculator. Uh, you can add a logo onto that one so that it's less PN centric. That being said, if they are clients of yours and they are working with you already, chances are your relationship with them is going to be so much stronger than their knowledge and awareness of PN. It's just a sticker in the bottom corner. So uh, as much as being able to remove it like might be useful, it's far more likely that your clients don't really care about that additional stuff. I'm curious to know, actually, Raphael, how often do your clients ask you like, hey, what is PN? I mean, actually, is uh, I haven't spoken to them about PN because I don't have like a certification from you guys yet, so they mm -hmm. don't know about PN because this is just my coaching. This is my way to get information. This is my mm -hmm. personal resource. So I don't, I don't talk to them about precision nutrition. There would be no reason to. It'd be like me talking to my clients and be like, "Hey, well, when uh, one of my professors ten years ago said this and." You should really follow that professor. Like that professor gives really great information. There's an, it doesn't really come up in conversation. No one cares. They've already done all the hurdles and all the vetting that they're going to do if they're sitting down in front of you having the conversation. Uh, and then also, it sounds like if you're not certified with PM, are you using the free calculator right now? The one that anyone can access online? Yeah, I found the, the re, that resource in the in the course. So I've been using it oh, okay. because I feel it has a lot of information, good information. And can save me some time instead of doing it myself. I'm, I'm using it as a resource. Cool. Yeah, and I mean, I would encourage you to continue doing so. If you want to spend a little bit more time, you can add your own, like affix your own logo to the printout, uh, depending on which pages you share with clients. I also take the same route as you. Uh, I only, I really highly selectively cherry pick the information that I give to my clients from there. Let's say if we're working on uh, carb intake, I'm going to, copy and paste or just like screen cap the report, take just the hand portion recommendations for carbs and send them that little image. And then the rest of the 10 pages or whatever length that report is, it's not super valuable to them. So I have no desire to make someone read 10 pages of information that is loosely related to what they're working on. Yeah, that makes so, sense. Yeah, I would encourage you to do the same. Chop it up, use it in whatever way makes sense for your needs. Uh, giving clients more information than they require at any given moment. So for some folks who are real knowledge seekers, they might say, wow, that's a real value add to me. For other folks, you've just given them another task and homework to do, which typically most adults are not looking forward to. Right. Uh, something that I would like to ask is... Um, well, so I've been reading. Uh, I'm not too far in the in the chapters of the of the course, but I have been reading in a little bit, and I understand that precision nutrition suggests that the best way to develop habits and make uh, sustainable changes are is not like tracking like your calories or tracking specifically. Uh, macros, but maybe hand portion. I don't know if I'm right with that. So, so far, or at the beginning at least, I was like tracking macros with the people or uh, using my fitness pal. But I also hmm. realized that this is not something that I want them to be doing for <laughs> the rest of their lives. So, I'm using this hand portion option, but also. I feel like there should be, or I don't know, maybe you can suggest something, another way to track that instead of using the, because there is like so, uh, a sheet in the report, I think, where you can print out and they can just check if they had 
uh, how many pounds of protein or, you know, the hand portion. Mm -hmm. So what suggestions do you have for tracking this? Uh, that is a great thing like that. Yep. So sorry, uh, that last bit I missed without using. Without using like um, this sheet uh, or my fitness pal or something like that. I'm just trying to make this sustainable for them. And some of them are just not wanting to track anything. Uh, yeah. But of course, it has to be one thing. Cool. Uh, yeah, definitely have, or I believe with this collective brain power of this group, we can come up with a solution for you here. Coaches, if you have a client who is resistant to tracking their intake, uh, as Raphael mentioned, going the macros route or a more invasive route is not working for them. What other alternative solutions do you use? What tools do you suggest to, uh, for clients who are in a similar position to uh, build more awareness of their intake? Because essentially that's what we're doing when we're looking to track. Tony, what do you got? There's a, I mean, for, for Raphael, there's a lot of different ways to kind of slice this, depending on how aggressive you want to be with your client and what kind of retention you want with these clients. If they're uh, assuming they're coming to you for weight loss or whether it be to improve their diet, depending on what, you know, how ready, willing, and able they are to make a commitment, I give them different paths. Like, hey, this is like super fast. Like, we want to get this by the X date. Here's kind of like the beginning for the long haul. And this is for like the rest of your life. And then I kind of let them have kind of choose your own adventure. And you usually always have them start with the, the skill of chewing slower first, which is one of the first recommendations is to chew slower and just add a vegetable if they're not willing to track. Because when it's, they'll start tracking the beginning because they'll be all excited, but that'll die off after the first you know week and a half or two weeks. Then you can start implementing more of the behavioral type stuff. But the, sometimes I get people that have me, they get to hire me for like a wedding or something like that. Then it's like, hey, we need to hit it hard and we got to track every morsel. Kind of so much, it would be some, somewhat akin to your like, uh, like your top level athletes that are getting ready for like an event. So I just kind of do very PN client centered and meet the client where they're at and then choose the, choose, have them kind of pick their own way of how they want to go about this. All right. Thank you. Any, thank you, uh, Tony. Any other additional feedback here? Any other uh, frameworks that coaches use here to help guide that process? Sito. Hi. So uh, something that I use is I um, ask them to share what they generally eat during a week. Uh, and I give them roughly an idea about the things that are high calorie um, and which are uh, I divide them into high calorie, high nutrition, high calorie, lower nutrition, which they can eat sometimes. Um, and then even things like dates and stuff, right? Like uh, this, uh, we have started seeing a lot on social media that dates, you can replace anything with dates, uh, but uh, dates are very high calorie food. So if their goal is to uh, if their goal is uh, weight loss or fat loss, uh, then they would have to eat that in moderation as well. They cannot just replace sugar with dates and expect that their weight would go down. Um, so just to kind of give a general idea to them about, hey, these are the things that uh, based on your uh, normal diet, these are the things that we need to be a bit wary about and uh, rest they can have. Like vegetables and fruits, I don't really discuss much because they are, in my opinion, like most of the vegetables are low calories. Um, so I don't worry about them. Even the fruits, most of them are okay. Uh, I aim at like nuts and seeds and dry, food, dry fruits. Um, and then whatever they have, like ultra processed food. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's what I do if they don't want to talk about calories. Cool. Thank you, Sita. Uh, Christina, what do you got? 
I would just add um, along what was already said that uh, I would ask a question, what is important to them right now? Because if they are bringing up a concern that they don't wanna track macros, track calories, then I would say, okay, well, how can we align your current goals, whatever they are with what they're willing to do right now? And kind of go from there. Uh, good place to build on. Kate, what do you got? When I think about tracking, I think about a continuum of tracking. So we fall somewhere between tracking all the things, all the calories, grams, and macronutrients, all the way to tracking none of the things. And there are many stops along the way between those two points we could track some of the things very precisely, but only some. For example, a client might only track the amount of protein they're getting or the number of servings of vegetables they're getting and nothing else. We can also estimate all of the things. Uh, and that's where the PN's hand portion method comes in because the hand is always with you. Uh, that's actually quite applicable to level one eaters um, who don't actually need the precision of weighing out raw chicken. Or we can estimate some of the things. Or like I said, we can not track at all. But I think also we can kind of consider what are we trying to do here? Because Raphael has used the word sustainable. I would argue that uh, perhaps, perhaps arguably for some, I actually don't think change needs to be sustainable. I think that's up to us as coaches and up to our clients. Uh, plenty of things are not sustainable. If you're going to train for an ultra marathon, that is not going to be a sustainable effort. That is not going to be a sustainable running volume. If you're going to be training for a powerlifting competition, uh, that is not going to be a sustainable change or training schedule. Now, if you're pursuing fat loss or weight loss, you could actually choose to pursue a more aggressive pace of weight loss. It's faster. Um, it's harder work and some people might choose that and we can then choose the tools that are appropriate for that. Like we're probably not going to be estimating things. If someone is down to work for for like a 10 week cut and they're weighing and kind of measuring all the things. So that's kind of where, where I'm going, where my brain is going here. Yeah, thank you. So most of my clients are um, aiming for fat loss. Basically, that's what what we are doing. It, that what you're saying makes sense. So I guess I should ask more like, uh, or present the options. Right? We can do this, and it you'll get faster results, or you can do this, and it's going to be slower, but it's going to change habits and. Again, it make it more like something that you can sustain for longer. Well, and you notice because what we get in there is probably a discussion relatively early on in the coaching converse in the like in a coaching relationship where we're actually assessing uh, what they're ready, able, and willing to do, and starting to build and manage expectations. Yeah, correct. Uh, yeah, because uh, sometimes I feel like people, what because this has happened, people would say, okay, I'm, I'm willing to do whatever I have to do. And then, okay, we are going to track this. And then <laughs> with the time, I just realized they are not, do not doing it because they were not used to that. So it's not something that. I think you're absolutely right. And I think this is where the coach's job is actually to read between the lines, right? Because if you have a client who's coming to you and they're a lifelong athlete and they have participated in bodybuilding competitions before, there is one thing you know, they know how to count calories. Like they know how to do that. They've done that before, right? Like versus if you have somebody who's like a 38 year old mom of three 
that had like doesn't really know much about protein or macros has never counted calories in her life to a certain extent like yeah she might be ready to count calories or she thinks she's ready but she also doesn't know what she doesn't know she doesn't know what is involved in counting calories and if that person is still gung ho on counting calories there might be a good chunk of time I would say at least two to four weeks where the only focus is learning how to count calories, right? Like that is a skill in itself. And I actually would argue that with coaches who use calorie counting, one of the biggest mistakes that they make is they assign calorie counting to somebody who doesn't know how to count calories. It's a skill, right? So we're handing a bike to somebody that doesn't know how to ride a bike. And then they, you know, fall on their face and it hurts. Correct. I like that analogy, Coach Kate. It's like, yeah, here, hop on this bike and ride to the store. And then you come back an hour later and they're still in the driveway. And it's like, well, I actually never knew how to ride a bike. So the expectation that we should see some level of relevant change or progress there where, uh, where really the tool is still the pro measure of progress, being able to use it more regularly, feeling confident with it. Uh, we shouldn't expect to see a hell of a lot of progress when we're introducing a new tool because it's just new. So that is a great call out. Uh, Raphael, you've gotten a lot of feedback here. Uh, anything that you're interested in implementing or any conversations that you think you would open up uh, with current clients or with future clients based on the feedback you've gotten? Uh, one of the things is I I think I'm going to start, like I said, maybe just having that discussion with the clients at the beginning and see what are they willing to do and and go from there. Uh, yeah, one and, thing that I want to add for you here, and it's a slight reframe on what you've already taken away from this, is equally, if not more important, what are you not willing to do? What do you dislike? Because especially if you're not the first coach or the first thing that they've tried, which is highly likely, they probably tried to do some things on their own before enlisting your help. What did they, understanding their previous experiences, there may have been some things where they're like, yeah, that was great and I loved it and I, I want to do more of that. But there also may be things where they're like, I friggin' hated that. And if we could avoid that at all costs, that would make me a much happier person. Of course. And then yeah, you don't get to step or you don't have to step in that steaming pile, which makes your life as a coach a lot easier as well. Yeah, all right. Uh, yeah, my clients are usually people who are just studying that they don't even know what the macro is. So maybe mm -hmm. they know basics like, oh, I've, I've heard about protein, but I don't even know where to get my pro protein from. So basically my clients are really beginners nutrition so yeah so uh, what i'm trying to to find is the way because what i promote or some of the my purposes with this is to make it uh something that they can apply for the rest of their life mm -hmm. at least give them the knowledge right so they can yeah. sustain it because uh, the purpose is to avoid that uh vicious circle of losing weight mm -hmm. and gaining it bad because they don't know how they got there. So um, trying to find a way to make out of this something that they can apply, like what would be the best way to start um, and progress from there? Like for mm -hmm. me, because I also went through this uh, process of uh, weight loss and I started counting calories, counting macros, and then uh, I was, uh, you know, um weighing my foods and everything so i learned but uh, and now i don't have to weigh my stuff because i can tell okay mm -hmm. if i'm eating this amount of uh, of uh, beef i'm getting this amount of protein so right you can eyeball it now mm -hmm. yeah, yeah so you can so eyeball it now based on the experience that you've had you built up enough yeah. of uh, uh awareness to say like visually i can estimate pretty close to what it is my needs are correct yeah and i if i if someone was going to tell me okay you have to count your 
or you know, or be measuring your food for the rest of your life, I wouldn't do it. <laughs> I don't know why my clients would be doing that either. So I'm just trying to figure out what's the best way to to make them aware uh, of this, like I became. But I don't know if the way that I learned is the right way. Maybe I just need to <laughs> to go further on the course and but I haven't been able. So I'm trying to fast forward a little bit. Uh, I hope everyone who is listening here or who watches in the future picks up on what just happened there. That was a coach realizing in real time that the thing that worked so well for them to the point where they felt strong enough in their understanding and knowledge to become a professional in this, that they just realized that that might not be the best way for everyone, which if we had that level of awareness on the internet all the time, the internet would be such a better place. Uh, so thank you for blessing us with that, with that gem, Raphael. I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, and I mean, I, uh, to summarize kind of some of the thoughts that were shared here, uh, both Coach Tony and Coach Kate mentioned having a spectrum of options available for your client, understanding what it is that your client is trying to achieve and currently like what is a comfortable timeline with them, adding in what they're not willing to do so you can take those options off the table and put them in, a, in your back pocket for a later discussion if they want to revisit that later. Uh, and then understanding kind of what is the, the most effective tool that will be within their realm of experience or comfort for right now in building off of that. You can always, you can always advance to higher skills. It typically is more challenging for people to be told that you're not good at this thing and I'm gonna take it away from you and give you an easier version. Some people appreciate it. Some people feel like it may be a blow to their ego and it feels like another failed experience, which is harder to normally uh, expectation set around as opposed to starting with a lower expectation and then building as they demonstrate skill and capacity. What I've been using that on that, Jeremy, is just giving them like the basic skill. And then if they log, if they do extra stuff, that's just bonus. Dude, if you want to do bonus, yeah. go for it. But this is kind of like what I think you can <laughs> do right now. <laughs> yep. Uh, sometimes as part of being the coaches, often kind of like you have that person who's incredibly excited. They're very motivated in that moment is trying to pull back on some of that to preserve that level of motivation for a slight bit, for a tiny bit longer. We don't expect it to last for all time always, but if we can get a little bit more of a slow burn instead of send them off like a rocket, we can harness that energy for a little bit longer. And we can try a little bit more things. We have a little bit more leeway with them. Whereas six months into the process, if they have tried the same tool and they keep kind of running their head into a wall, it's gonna be really hard to tell them, you know what? Let's go to easy mode now. Thank you all. No worries. Thank you for bringing up that discussion. Uh, anyone have anything else that they would like to discuss for today? Hello, I have a question. Please. So, well, I... Um... I do online coaching and I usually have weekly check-ins with my clients. So I have like a 35 or 40 minutes call with them weekly. Mm -hmm. um, and for example, if I, ha if I have uh, somebody, I would set weekly goals for them, like very specific and simple goals. I try to simplify everything for them. Um, for example, if I, I usually ask them if they're willing to do that for the week and they're, oh yeah, of course I'll be able to do that. And then when it gets like, when we have the other check-in, sometimes they are like, oh, I was not able to do it. Although we discussed that before and they were, they said that they were willing. Um, I usually try to like progress with like those weekly goals, but in that case, what do you like what would you su suggest uh for you know like coaching them for example should i just keep saying like sorry should i just like keep uh setting the same goal for them or maybe switching 
I was trying something else because it's just have been like one week. So I don't know if I should be like keep trying with the same goal or maybe changing. If they, for, for example, just to give you a little bit of context also there. Um, for example, uh, when I, um, when I check in with them, what went wrong or well, not that way, but w w I ask them like, uh, why do you think this was so, you know, challenging for you to do it this week? They're like, oh, no, no, I was very busy. I don't know. I just forgot. I can do it this coming week. Like, what should I, how should I address that? um somebody texted i think um yeah. for example so kate was asking the text uh can you give us an example of a goal yeah so for example um for example uh i go very very specific so last time somebody a client of mine she was feeling like very low energy she was saying like oh maybe i should have a bigger breakfast and I was like yeah that makes a lot of sense she was just having like one egg one boiled egg and I was like yeah we can try to add a little bit more fiber we can um try to have maybe like two or three eggs if that works for you and also maybe add a fruit or I mean I was giving a lot of options and at the end we came up with oh maybe a toast cottage cheese and two eggs I was super specific and I was like yeah yeah she she was like I can do it I can go today and buy that today because I she, I'm doing grocery shopping and I can do it well he didn't <laughs> and we were like we like she agreed to that um because she had the time but I don't know like she just didn't do it uh I mean something came up I think but I think she just do it like once during the week. Um, I don't know if, I mean, I said that she could try to do that the next week. That was yesterday. I told her. Here, Valentina, for the sake of time, I'm going to pause you here. I think we have enough information to work with, but uh, well, let's get some consensus from our coaches here because this is essentially you've explained the crux of all of coaching. A client agrees to do something. The client does not do that thing, what do I do? Let's see what our coaches have to say here and I think we'll have some great feedback for you. Leah, what do you got? So this is like falling back to that basic of constantly asking the question of what worked and what didn't. Um, I use that all the time um, because the thing is, is about coaching is that we are there to guide them but we're not guiding them if we're constantly telling them what to do. Um, and then they're not coming up with the answers. So that's when we have to put the ball back in their court and we have to ask them, okay, you know, um, for your example of the food, right? Hey, we talked about adding more food. Uh, what happened? She answers with, you know, I got busy. Okay, well, what worked for you? Did that work? Did you feel more energy? Did you feel energized? So that way it makes it more important for the client. Um, to be able to make those changes. So now she's putting those pieces together. We already know the answer, um, but she has to put those, those pieces together to be able to make those changes for herself. So she could just be like, you know, I got busy and it could be like, you know, I just didn't prioritize it. Um, but then it's like, okay, but did it work? How did it work? Um, those are just always great to fall back on, on everything. Any goal that I give my client, um, I ask them that regardless if they did the goal or not, uh, it's always good to just follow back because then it's also that positive reinforcement. And that's like our treat per se um, of feeling good about how this worked. We did really good. And then what didn't work? How did it work? How are we going to learn from it and then move forward? Right. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> yep, so as Leah points out there, uh, and you may experience this for several weeks as a coach, where there's an action that the client has agreed on, either you've led the client there, 
which that's an opportunity for you as the coach to take a step back and say, okay, I led that last conversation a little bit. I'm curious to know what, uh, what alternatives come to mind for you. This is your life. You're more familiar with it than I am. If there's something that feels a little bit easier for you to do right now or a little bit more appropriate or you're more willing to do that, what would that look like? So fleshing out their idea is certainly valuable. You will also have clients who this entire operation is completely client-led. Uh, I had this client today where they were saying, for the last three weeks, we've had this conversation where they continuously said, I should add in more strength training. They were getting in a great amount of movement, averaging one to two hours on their bike per day. Uh, and they said, I want to add in strength training this week. And I said, okay, cool. And the next week we checked in, they told me all the great things they did. And then begrudgingly were like, didn't get in strength training. And I said, okay, you still think it's valuable for you? Yeah, I'm going to do it this week. Second week uh, goes through, third week check-in. I didn't do it again today. I was going to do it before our meeting, but still didn't do it. This is one of the most common scenarios you're going to get in coaching where there's an action that is agreed upon, either client-led or coach-led, and it doesn't happen. As Leah mentioned, there are some really valuable things that you can take from those interactions that don't require you to do or suggest anything vastly different. What you can start with is just understand, why did we want to do the thing? Is it still valuable to you? Does this feel like something that you should do because I told you to do it, because the internet told you to do it, because your girlfriend at work does it? Or is this something that has real intrinsic value to you and you believe it will improve the quality of your life? So let's really qualify that this is a thing that you actually want to do. If you didn't do it last week, what were some of the barriers that you faced? So you got busy. What does busy mean? Were you busy with work? Were you busy with kids? Were you busy with other obligations? If so, are you likely to face a similar level of busyness again in those things next week? If it's valuable, we can problem solve with those things. You can throw some ideas out. I can throw some ideas out. Uh, if that is a one-off scenario, then it probably doesn't really matter that much and give it another go next week. No change needed. If this is something that comes up quite frequently, let's try and address for it. Let's plan with that in mind. So as I put in the chat box, here's what you had uh, agreed on the week before. Let's modify that plan so that you have a backup plan. If busy presents its head again, here is what you can do alternatively. So you can still be successful, still move towards your goal without having to rearrange the entirety of your life. And that is like a very summarized version of what possibly can add in there. And I know we're short on time, but I want to throw to Kate real quick. Yeah, Jaron, no, I think you, you covered it incredibly well. I think if I were to summarize what I see as trends, there's probably two reasons why people do not do what they said they would. It's not important or it's too big. So our task is to figure out which one it is. Is, is it not important or is it too big? And when a coach is looking for more information in terms of what went wrong, um, I would argue that we need more information than we think we do. You should be able to close your eyes and envision exactly what happened for that client in the moment when the toast did not happen, cottage cheese did not happen. Like what happened? Was she run over on her way to the grocery store? Did she like, so notice how specific we are getting here. It's not like, oh, it didn't happen. Oh, okay, cool. Let's try it next week. Okay, cool. Like there's no judgment here, but we're going to, really nail down as to what got in the way. Did she not get to a grocery store at all? If she got to the grocery store, what prevented her from buying cottage cheese? Was it that it's not on her list? Oftentimes, too many options are confusing. So if we want bigger breakfast and the options are, well, instead of having one egg, have two or three, or you could add fruit or toast or cottage cheese, that is a lot of decisions to make on a Tuesday morning. And if we were to shrink it, as Tony suggested, I think in the comments, right? It's like, nope, the goal is you have one egg. You know what that tells me if you have one egg every morning is that you have eggs in your fridge. And if you can have one egg, you can have two eggs. So the task is to have two eggs. That's it, right? It's super stupid, simple, like as tiny as we can make it. And you notice it's not actually a new thing. It's a thing that the client is doing already. 
which is also powerful. Like, I'm not asking you to do anything. Maybe like you don't like cottage cheese. You know, it's healthy. Yeah, blah, blah, blah. I'm supposed to be eating cottage cheese. We already know you're eating eggs. We already know you don't mind eating them every day. So how specific can we get? How small can we get? And how detailed can we collect that data on the quote unquote failure, on the barrier, like on the obstacle that got in the way? Excellent uh, addition there, Kate. I popped something into the chat box where, uh, as Kate mentioned, if your client can't really articulate what busy was like, my experience has led me to believe that's more in alignment with this is not super clear to me or is not super valued to, or valuable to me or the clarity of like, why this is valuable is, is something that we need to tackle before getting to the nitty gritty of details and more planning or asking for more specific uh, actions to be taken. Like if your client was like, yeah, I just got really busy. It's like, what were they busy doing? It's like, ah, I don't know. Just like life really got away from me. That's a person who is just like, that wasn't really a high priority for me. There was several other things that were at least equal, if not higher priority. Therefore, this thing didn't get done. So an opportunity to clarify and understand again, what value does this offer to you? And if they're not super clear on it before you have that conversation, your job is to have greater clarity when you exit that conversation. Uh, and that took us right to time. Valentina, uh, was that useful feedback for you? That was very, very, very useful. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, great question. Thank you for asking. Uh, yeah, we are right on time, folks. We'll call it here for today. Again, thank you all for your questions and for your contributions. Uh, and I hope to see you again at the next one. Kate, you have the schedule up for the next one by any chance? Hold on. Hold on. Oh, the next one is, it's a me call. And we're back on Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern. Cool. I'll see y'all then. Cheers, gang.